You can tweet on this debate um, using hashtag TGD16, which is, which is up there on the slide, uh, and also, of course, uh, hashtag EGU16. I shall just quickly run through the blurb, and then I shall introduce our, our speakers and uh, just give you an idea of, of how we're going to, to run this session. Um, so discussion of natural resource depletion has been widespread for over four decades, yet there still seems to be little consensus on what to do about it. Some argue that small is beautiful, and some argue we should all consume less, but others believe we, think to th we need to think more ambitiously and the only limit to resources is our imagination. So how do we, as geoscientists, engage with these highly differing positions? Is the demand for natural resources exceeding what the Earth can produce? If so, what can we do about it? As our knowledge grows, does our ability to act and solve problems grow with it? Now, one of the ideas of looking at this topic today was really to set a challenge to everybody here, not just to our speakers, to really think about how we can use our knowledge and act and, uh, and do something for the betterment of humankind. Okay, uh, the speakers will each be given eight minutes. They will then be given a couple of minutes to, to come back on, on each other's introductions, but most of the time is gonna be given over to you, so I will encourage people to ask questions and make points, um, and we'll get to that bit as soon as possible. I hope that this will be a conversation between you and the panel, and between yourselves as well. So do feel free to make, make points and not just ask questions. So to our eminent panel, which I'm, I'm very pleased we've got such a great panel today. Um, on my far right here we have Professor Gunter Boschel, who I'm sure will be familiar to many of you. He's Vice President of EGU and was its President from 2013 to 2015, and President of the Division of Hydrological Sciences of EGU from 2002 to 2007. His principal research interests are understanding and predicting hydrological processes across scales. He's operating the Hydrological Open Air Laboratory that aims to understand flow and transport processes with high temporal and spatial detail and is interested in distributed hydrological modeling using remotely sensed snow and soil moisture data, scale issues, regional process hydrology, climate change impacts, environmental change, socio-hydrology, predictions of floods and droughts, and flood risk estimation. So uh, a bit of a shortage of subjects there, I think. <laughs> the fruits of his research, about 300 articles and over 8,000 citations, have been recognized by the receipt of numerous honors, including the IHS uh, UNESCO WMO Hydrological Sciences Award, election as a fellow of AGU, member of the German Academy of Sciences and Engineering, um, corresponding member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences and the AGU Horton Medal. Recently, he was awarded the advance grant of the European Research Council on Flood River Changes. He is editor of Hydrology and Earth System Sciences and Water Resources Research, and is an editorial board member of five other leading journals. He chairs the Scientific Advisory Council of the German Federal Institute of Hydrology and sits on the steering committee of the NFP61 of the Swiss Na National Science Foundation. He's been the chair of the Predictions in Ungaged Basins, the PUB initiative of the International Association of Hydrological Sciences, whose synthesis book he's edited. He's also participated in teaching at all university levels, has mentored three generations of students over the past 20 years. Is founder and director of the Vienna Doctoral Programme on Water Resources Systems and a multi-year interdisciplinary PhD programme at the Vienna University of Technology funded by the Austrian Science Fund that focuses on connecting biochemical and ecological processes impacting on water quality. Throughout his career, Professor Bloschel has been a strong advocate of bri bridging the gap between fundamental process understanding and the practice of water resources management. Next to him, and to my immediate right, we have Livia Paisa. Um, is that the correct pronunciation? 
Pfizer. <laughs> uh, Livia is a spatial analysis of officer in the Land and Water Division of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Her work focuses on water resources assessment, water use in agriculture, agricultural water management for rural poverty alleviation. She's currently involved in projects related to water accounting and crop water productivity monitoring in Africa, the Near East and Asia. Through her work, she brings innovative remote sensing applications in agricultural development programs while maintaining a people-centered approach. She's a geographer with specialization in spatial analysis and natural resources management. Prior to joining FAO, she had been applying GIS and remote sensing tools for several years on different subjects in the UN and other development organizations. Food security and vulnerability analysis, forest monitoring, cadastral mapping, which I don't even know what that is, so I'm quite intrigued by that one, and archaeological sites monitoring. On my left here, we have uh, Dr. Ioana Popescu, um, who is an old colleague of mine. I'm very pleased to, to see her on the panel here today. She's currently Associate Professor of Hydroinformatics at UNESCO IHE, the Institute for Water Education in Delft, the Netherlands. Her research focuses on computational methods, aspects of flood modeling and vulnerability related to floods, lake and reservoir modeling, and water supply systems modeling and optimization. She's particularly interested in integrating mathematical models into decision support systems. She's a member of several engineering associations and research schools, like the International Association for Hydro Environment Engineering and Research, the EGU, and of the SENSE Research School. Currently, she's chair of the IHR Committee on Education and Professional Development. Prior to joining UNESCO IHE in, in 2001, she worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Research and Construction of the National Research Council of Canada in the area of rehabilitation of urban infrastructure, where she was involved in the development of a finite element-based prediction tool for flexible pavement structures subject to both environmental and traffic-induced loading. Previous to that, she worked as an associate professor at, at the Faculty of Hydrotechnics, uh, Timisora in Romania. I'm not sure if that's the correct pronunciation either. Uh, in the area of riv river systems modeling and computational hydraulics. In particular, she was involved in the development of a finite element code for testing the influence of hydrodynamic pressures on dams and in projects and teaching related to hydropower and dams. And last but not least, uh, on my far left, we have uh, Professor James Woodhausen, um, who's also an old friend of the Great Debate. He's spoken for us before, and we're very pleased to have him here. James is a journalist and author of several books. He's currently a visiting professor at London South Bank University, and was previously professor of forecasting and innovation at De Montfort University, Leicester. James has a knack of registering trends before other people and offering counterintuitive proposals on what to do about those trends. His diverse contributions span nearly five decades, including helping to install and test Britain's first computer-controlled car park in 1968, writing about chemical weapons of mass destruction in The Economist in 1978, co-directing Britain's first major study into the future of e-commerce in the 1980s, working for the Henley Centre, Britain's best-known think tank on EU markets, where he built up the firm's forecasting on the broader future of IT and proposed in 1992 that the internet be delivered over TV. He reorganised worldwide market intelligence at Philips Consumer Electronics in 1995-7, issuing a devastating critique of America's dot-com boom in 1999. <laughs> okay, I shall skip to Energize. So his 2008 book, Energize, A Future for Energy Innovation, co-authored with Joe Kaplinsky, is a powerful treatise which, on top of discussing the nature and extent of climate change, analyzes humanity's response to it. Okay, so without further ado, I shall hand over to Gunter. Um, you have eight minutes. I need to get your slides up, don't I? And I shall just do that. Is that it? No. How do we 
you get loads of this up. I don't know how to do this. Very good. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, do we have enough resources on this globe? And one of the most important resources is actually water. All of life depends on water. You, you look at the landscape in the desert or in a place like Austria, you see a huge difference, and much of it is because of the availability of water. And human life also needs water, and my first slide shows that actually not all the people in the world have enough water. A billion people don't have access to improved water supply. A billion people. And there are more than two billion people don't have or improved sanitation, which really means that more than three million people annually die because of inappropriate water supply or water treatment. It's, it's a huge figure. And why is that so? It has to do with that the water demand and the water availability are not always aligned. As a ballpark figure, on average, on the globe, each person needs one cubic meter of water every year for drinking water. One cubic meter for drinking. Then it's 10 cubic meters per year for household use, 100 cubic meters for industrial use, and if the food is produced through irrigation, irrigated crops, then it's 1,000 cubic meters per person and year. The average of all the different uses would be, over the globe, 800 cubic meters of water per person every year. So is this water available? In fact, when you average, again, over the globe, over a long period of time, we have much more than that. We have 6,400 cubic meters of water per pay person, per year available, which is almost 10 times of what we need. Then you may ask, why is it? We have almost 10 times as much water than what we need, and the fact is, water, the available water, is not distributed evenly around the globe. There are places with more water and less water, there are deserts, and there are arid places, and there are humid or wet places, because this misalignment in space but also in time, there is water shortage. And so my next slide gives the reason why people don't have enough water. And the main reason is indeed the uneven distribution of water availability in space and time. But there, is also, there are also other reasons. Uh, decreasing resources. There are, in some places, uh, some places get drier with climate change and for other reason or pollution. So the availability also in many places decreases with time. And this is probably one of the reasons why we're having this debate in the first place. Then the, th the third point on the slide is increased demand. So there is not only the availability, but also the demand side we have to, to consider. Increasing demand because of population growth, changes in the lifestyle. For example, China has had quite a dramatic change in lifestyle in the past three decades with much more uh, meat consumption than in earlier days. And if is meat is related to irrigation for fodder, for beef, for example, then it implies a much bigger water consumption than when uh, vegetarian food is eaten. Uh, then there is uh, changing lifestyles, changing preferences, and the next point is economic issues. In quite a few places of the world, there is enough water, but there are economic issues, so the water does not reach the households, um, particularly in water scarce regions. This is what we call a, an economic drought or economic water scarcity. And finally, water management is not always optimum. In some places, it's fragmented, and uh, could be improved. So these are some of the reasons why there is water shortage for many people around the world. An important aspect of that is that we should not look at water individually, but in the context of other resources and other things um, humankind needs, particularly the relationship between water, food and energy, what's called the water-food-energy nexus. What this term implies is that the consumption of water 
and uh, the availability of water is related to the consumption and the availability of food and of energy. For example, for producing one kilogram of wheat in irrigated agriculture, there is a requirement for about one cubic meter of water. But in contrast, for producing beef, through the fodder of the beef, we need 10 times the amount of water. So the diet matters and food is related to water. But also, water is also related to energy in two ways. For energy production, water is needed. For example, for cooling towers, towers they have consumptive water use, but also um, for water supply, we need energy. So I'm going to the next slide. So what can we do to address the global water crisis? There are different areas that can be approached in order to alleviate water shortage. There are technical approaches, for example, improved irrigation methods using drip irrigation rather than sprinkler irrigation. Uh, technical measures include storing water from the dry to the wet season, water transfers from dry to wet places, uh, and uh, sanitation by adaptive technologies. Then there are organizational approaches that is using only renewable resources in many places, particularly every places of the world. Water is used, particularly groundwater, in a non-sustainable way. People take more water out of the subsurface than is recharged, repleted. Uh, so recharged by the, by the rainfall which results in a depletion of the water resources, particularly of groundwater. Then other organizational approaches include cross-sectoral management strategies, not looking at water alone, but also at other, in, other economic sectors, such as industry, tourism, and water demand. Okay, so there are economic approaches, and there are political approaches, and I'm going to my last slide and talking briefly about the opportunities we have in water management related to the science, to the science we do. There's a new field in hydrology that is called socio-hydrology, which is about the feedbacks between human and water, between people and water. And one of the things that uh, we can do to better manage the resources is to better understand the long-term feedbacks between water and people. So on the left hand side there's a slide about changing, um, changing uh, sensitivity of people to environmental concerns related to water from an Australian case study and the right hand slide shows some modeling studies about the feedbacks between water availability for the ancient Myers in Central America in the 7th century and their population dynamics. So, in, 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 uh, as a final statement now, it is important that we link hydrology with other fields, particularly related to human behavior, and to look at the long-term feedbacks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. It's my first time at EGU, and I'm really impressed. I mean, it's really hard to get lost in VN these days. You just need to, sw to follow these swarms of people with the posters, and you get here in no time, and this is really amazing. Um, so thank you for the organizer who gave me the opportunity to participate in this debate. Uh, this is a debate where I must admit I'm a bit like a fish out of water, I think, because I'm, I'm not a scientist, unlike most of you here. And, um, but however, I do work with science, and in my work I, I try to understand what uh, science can bring to those who make decisions on the field every day, actually on their farms. And in fact, I will bring the voice of uh, agriculture to this debate. Agriculture, as already uh, uh, pointed, was pointed at very effectively by Professor Blush, is, is a, a major, is a sector which has major negative impacts on the Earth's uh, ecosystem. And is probably co if we are here today reflecting on the future of our planet. 
Um, yet, agriculture fits all of us, fits uh, you, fits us, and think about it, it also employs one, more than one in three of the world workers worldwide. I mean, this figure, I think this doesn't really represent the workforce in this room, but beyond these walls and beyond Europe, it definitely does, and I think uh, we shouldn't forget that. So if the question is, is there enough resource for, for all? I think, for me, the answer is yes. And in fact, agriculture produces enough food uh, for more than 12 billion people, which is much more than the actual and the foreseen population. Uh, but one in eight still live with chronic hunger. And by the way, 60% of the undernourished are women, uh, despite their major labor contribution, but that would probably be the subject of a different debate, so I will leave it. Uh, and also, agriculture has, has achieved a tremendous uh, threefold increase in production over the last 50 years, but at very high environmental costs, which you as geoscientists know very well. And these costs are also likely to increase, as we have heard, uh, considering the unprecedented confluence of pressure linked to demographic and economic growth to the associated dietary trends and, of course, climate change. So I think that in order to, our, to answer the questions of uh, today's debate, we really need to look at a broader concept that balances the economic, the social and the environmental dimensions of uh, sustainability in agriculture. And FAO has taken up this challenge of building a common vision for sustainable food and agriculture. And through this vision, I mean, this vision doesn't really prescribe recipes because we have seen that this quite doesn't work, but it sets the basic conditions for sustainable agriculture. Um, it's, so these conditions are, are explained in five pillars, which I would like to briefly mention to you because I think it's, they are very relevant to, for today's discussion. So the first one is about improving the efficiency in the use of resources. The second one is about uh, the, the conservation and protection of natural resources. The third principle says that uh, agriculture that fails to protect and enhance livelihood, livelihood so, uh, equity and social well-being is unsustainable. And the, the fourth one is about the resilience of communities and ecosystems. And the last but not least, is that sustainable agriculture requires responsible and effective uh, governance mechanisms. These principles then translate into a number of uh, integrated approaches as the water, energy and food nexus, whereby an in-depth and uh, cross-sectoral understanding of the synergies and trade-offs in natural resources can help shape policy, sustainable policy options. And I would move toward the conclusion by providing a couple of practical examples of these integrated approaches. So um, take, for example, solar-powered irrigation. It's a very nice water, energy and food uh, nexus example because it's, it's really, on one, on one hand, it uh, decreased carbon uh, emission. On the other hand, it really helps the farmer uh, whose main uh, um, constraint in irrigation is very often the cost of fuel, the cost of energy. But think of solar power irrigation, imagine that it, when it's promoted in areas where groundwater are already used beyond their recharge level. That could potentially cause really uh, major negative impacts and overexploit groundwater resources. But luckily for us, there are areas, for example, in West India, where um, the government and research organizations have come up with possible solutions whereby farmers can sell the surplus energy back to the grid. And in that way, instead of using energy to pump water, they would uh, get cash for it. That is a very promising approach, and we'll see how that could be uh, adapted to other contexts, because every context has its uh, particular requirements. And another example, a completely different um, level of intervention uh, comes from, for example, in Central Asia, in the Sir Daria Basin, for example, where um, a balance, I mean, there used to be a balance between upstream and downstream countries exchanging water 
and uh, energy and water for irrigation. But that balance doesn't, doesn't survive anymore because of the changes in the political and uh, economic uh, environment. So a new balance needs to be found, but the first uh, thing to do is build a neutral dialogue platform between the riparian countries and building trust, trust in data, trust in information base, and that is where FAO and other organizations are, are joining forces. And I mean, to, to make it short, to, there are a number of other examples which I would like to make to you, but I think that the common point in all integrated approaches, therefore in sustainable agriculture, is that we need a robust uh, assessment of the availability of the resources on their use, and that's exactly where the geoscience community can bring a tremendous impact. And uh, we really need to understand each other uh, to, to, to face the challenges we have ahead of us. So, thank you. Hello. Welcome to this debate. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure to hear my previous speakers and to hear that there is enough resource for all. So the main question is how, as a scientist, we can uh, contribute that uh, this resource will not be depleted, but there is enough for uh, everyone. I also wanted to uh, address the issue of water and uh, to complement what uh, the previous speakers were saying. So if I look to the last eight years what the scientists were doing at the World Water Assessment uh, Report. Uh, there were seven reports issued and it started with water and people and the policies that uh, are um, applied. Then it went to uh, the approaches on the sustainability, uh, how the managing of water will be done under risk uh, and uncertainty. Uh, and the last one, which was just issued this year, is about water and jobs. And though the link might not be so obvious that water is linked to job, not only from the health point of view, but also from the economic uh, growth point of view, there is a clear link between water and jobs. And if there is no water, there is no future. Well, we hear that there will be enough uh, water, but the problem is how to bring the right amount of water there where it where it is not. So that is the most important. So um, nowadays, um, society looks at scientists to come up with uh, quick, uh, uh, quick responses and with sustainable solutions, also just solution uh, for uh, water management. And how to do that? That w can only be done by involving uh, different levels of society, uh, by involving um, not only the public, but also decision makers from different cultures, from different uh, parts of the world. And uh, also uh, hearing the voice of uh, science from different disciplines, integrating that. It might not be so obvious, but sharing uh, a sharing knowledge platform, that is what it is needed, sharing data and making this data uh, known uh, to everyone and understandable to everyone. Uh, certain uh, attempts have been done and uh, the work has started, uh, however, there is still a lot to be done in that area of sharing and not keeping the data for business purposes, but uh, really sharing uh, the data, going from capacity building to capacity uh, development. And um, how to do even more uh, that uh, I will come back to this idea. Uh, let me tell you about uh, a site which UN is maintaining and it's called My World. If you check the site, everyone checking the site is invited to vote and to select between several issues what are the most uh, six important for the voter. Uh, there are statistics provided uh, on the site on what is the most important. And what is very interesting is that by far education is considered by the public the most important, no matter from where the voter is. There are statistics depending on the region of the world, on, uh, the, on the age of the voter, on the education of the voter, whether it is a man or a woman. So everyone by far considers that education is what is important. So linking that with uh, science, that education is important. So society already tells that they need 
knowledge to be uh, shared and to be known, so data uh, to be uh, shared to everyone. By that, the societies will have uh, uh, their own chance to select solutions for management and to uh, understand what they are doing. So, uh, I am advocating for an open knowledge, an open science, uh, where responsibility are not only with the universities, but also they are with the national uh, uh, policy makers that are setting uh, research lines uh, for the future, for those who are also giving uh, funds for research, so that uh, all the issues related to water and to resources are uh, tackled. So um, there is also a need for a lot of dedicated uh, work from the scientists uh, in that respect. So. This is what I wanted to address. Thank you. Um, is there a thing for advancing the slides? Did you have the, for advancing the slides? Was that? Left. Where's the clicker? You got the clicker? Okay, it. magic. And we'll just get your slides up. Okay. We're going for the full screen view here. Thank you so much. Get rid of the hand, maybe. No, the hand is still there. Well, the hand is me. Maybe the hand is me. Um, well, thanks very much, everybody. Um, let's try and do this. Nope. I want extra time for this. No, it's not going down. Okay. Uh, well, this is this morning's news in London. Uh, Queen Victoria is worried about air pollution. And uh, this is last year in India. Uh, in Delhi, in fact, India Gate. And there in the newspapers, they look at particulates every morning. Um, and so we seem to be making, ladies and gentlemen, a world in chains. And uh, I will agree with the speakers about education, open science, um, trust, and all of these things. But I think, ich macht heute Abend einer Kulturkampf. Uh, I want today to make a slightly more ideological and cultural struggle. And oddly enough, I want to begin with um, Christine Lagarde. I don't much like Christine Lagarde and the IMF, uh, and I'm rather bored by her rather long uh, report just recently, but if you look at that report and you go to the small print, you will find that uh, under structural reforms in the bottom left, looking at advanced economies, they want infrastructure investments in the advanced economies, and there's limited progress there, so they say at the IMF. And in the same way, if you go to the low-income developing countries, that's not China, that's Kenya and places like that, you can see that the red in the, uh, the final part of the uh, <coughs> disc there, infrastructure investments, is very red again, just like it was in the advanced world. Uneven progress, they are saying, in addressing uh, energy infrastructure bottlenecks. So I want to say, is the problem with the world that really when we have too many people and people ought to start dying, stop uh, making love and babies, stop breathing out carbon dioxide and adding to the climate change and so on, or do we face what I believe we face, an infrastructure problem in food, in water, and in energy. And it seems to me that you don't have to be a free market neoliberal supply cider on none of those things to believe that we have, as the speakers have already hinted, many solutions available to us to counter water unavailability, food unavailability, energy unavailability, and those solutions are more on the supply side for me than in what Gunther says about changing human behavior or building trust or having open science. So let me try to illustrate that. I'm by nature a forecaster. It's a good idea to look ahead. It's an even better idea to take the lens caps off your binoculars uh, when you look ahead. 
And I just want to say a very simple thing about you know, why I became interested in science and technology and all of these things, because it's important to take risks in life. Not every risk, but to take some risks. And the reason I got into it was because this was ha what happened in my Kellogg's Corn Flakes packet in 1964. You can see the United Nations is on a humanitarian intervention in the moon there. And this man was one of my heroes. Anybody know who he is? It's Yuri Gagarin. But look, he's smoking. How terrible. How naughty. But he was a hero. He took a lot of risks. The Soviets knew nothing about weightlessness. Uh, they, they knew nothing. We, we run forward about 40 years. And um, what we find in Britain, which always leads the world into decline, is that they don't want to take any risks. And now what's happening in Britain is that you even recruit young kids to against taking risks, against fracking, and all of these things. And you look at it from the sociological point of view, which our friends have re rightly recommended to us, you see all the things that we'd like to stop in England. Stop the world. I want to get off. Trump, Israel, Russia, Hungary is a new entry, uh, plastic bags, tax avoidance, um, fast food, genetically modified foods. We'd like to ban pretty much everything in Britain, uh, except the British, of course, because we're, we're wonderful, aren't we? So, I, you know, I can't get along with that. I was always more interested in the whole of the planet and in taking risks a little bit, not like the British. Well, let me just say, I believe we have to recapture the romance of agriculture and of food. If you look at the great designers in the world, like Raymond Lowy, I just discovered this. He did some bad things with smoking, like making Lucky Strike American. But one of his first jobs, in fact, was with International Harvester to improve the productivity of harvesting. And it's the same with the other great uh, founder of American industrial design, Henry Dreyfus. He did a little product that you might know. He was the first person to come up with that. And what he did for John Deere uh, and all of that, going to, uh, within, in his office in Madison Avenue, dramatically raised the productivity of agriculture in the United States. Now, when we come forward to today, we can see many other methods, precision agriculture, precision irrigation, satellite-driven from the Norwegians. It's got to be good. Uh, and it's not just precision agriculture, but we're seeing in capital goods generally in agriculture, the Internet of Things move ahead uh, with JCB in India able to coordinate lots and lots of machines at the same time. And with the Internet of Th Things, um, we're able to d order new parts, order new equipment, know when things are breaking down. And that's before we've even got driverless tractors, which I think are much more likely than driverless cars. And um, although I'd prefer to see this kind of design than uh, that kind of design. I think this is uh, more fun. And that's before we've raised the productivity of agriculture further by going for genetically modified tomatoes. I know that all of you have lost a friend or a dear relative to genetically modified tomatoes. And I, I'm hoping that you're going to set up a campaign about that so that their death is not forgotten. You know, it won't be in vain. But as far as I'm aware, in Brazil and America, the deaths from genetically modified tomatoes are none. And if you look at uh, Brazil growing trees in seven years uh, rather than 70, we see a similar opportunity to build carbon sinks to combat climate change. So I think that when we look at agriculture, we can see rising yields until 2009, and then we see declining yields because of the productivity crisis throughout the West that exists in industry and in agriculture. But in fact, until 2009, if you look at the red bits, which are when the yield is going down, if you look at maize there on the left, a bit of a problem in Eastern Africa, uh, then we go to rice, a bit of a problem in Nigeria, red. But you can see the other areas, yields have generally gone up in agriculture. And yet the, what we read in the papers is there's no way we can survive. The Malthusian perspective tends to suggest that birth control and uh, um, changing behavior is the way forward. But actually, if you go beyond the news reports, I think you will find in the genuine article that uh, if you... If, sorry? Half a minute. Well, all right, half a minute. Um, 
you'll find that best management practices could make a very di big difference to the world. And in fact, that's the conclusion also uh, of this report by the Reserve Bank of Australia looking at what's happened in India. Better management practices have actually helped the ability of India to combat drought and improve agriculture through irrigation and water management over the past few years. So I'm very confident that we can do more to improve agriculture, more to improve water management, that the problem is not too many people behaving badly. The problem is that even in the West, we are no longer interested in investment. There is much less automation than all that Silicon Valley would suggest. And in fact, the solution to our problems in food and in energy, as elsewhere, is, lies in our hands. If we take more seriously the automation of food, agriculture, and hydrology, we can solve the problems of the planet, and the resources for do doing that completely exist. None of this is to endorse the current system, free market economics, or any of those things. It's to endorse humans' ingenuity in solving problems. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to invite the panel to um, make brief responses um, to what's gone so far, um, but just a couple of minutes each. Um, because I do want to get out to the, the floor as soon as possible. So, uh, Gunter, if you'd like to comment on, on anything that's, that, that's uh, come up so far. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, um, I think there have been very important points uh, have been brought up. For Lydia, talking about the importance of cross-sectoral uh, research and cross-sectoral management and integrated approach, I think this is really central that we don't look at one resource alone. And actually from my experience, what I see here in EGU, EGU and my experience with running EGU for a couple of years, I think there's a lot of potential that we get together across the disciplines, not just working in our divisions alone, but use the meeting use the network we're building here to cut across the different disciplines uh, within EGU. And I think this is extremely relevant for this integrated approach for managing the resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia. Um, I'd rather use this one. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Uh, well, I completely agree with, uh, with uh, the, the speakers in particular with, for one thing which I think has been pointed out in both by, um, I mean, the last two speakers, I can't remember all the name, um, and that's basically about uh, investments and, and capacity development. And for that, I would like to, to, remind, to remind you that um, research in agriculture has been um, declining in the last years. I mean, the global figure is a positive figure because of uh, low of middle and high income countries such as China and India, which have really boosted the, their agricultural research and development sector. But where it is most needed in developing countries, research in agriculture has really been declining. And that is, that is a problem because then that means that you have no investments because <laughs> there's no investment without prior research and you have no capacity development to support the implementation because the other very important thing is that innovation is great and probably is more than ever a matter of survival nowadays but if that innovation is not taken up is not uh, is not used then there's no no use for it i mean it's wasted so that's it thank you okay, thank you Thank you. I fully agree with all the, uh, three uh, speakers and uh, I think that uh, apart from uh, managing uh, and investment, the investment should go in technologies that will bring uh, better solutions and solutions for management. Also, I fully agreed with uh, the, um, what was mentioned about the trust that uh, 
people should build trust in data and that is where the scientists can help in build this trust and that's a very long process that can be done only through dialogue, through networking, through uh, coming to uh, different uh, gatherings where uh, this trust can be built. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I don't agree with the previous speakers. Uh, I think we're a bit too United Nations uh, here. Uh, and the, I mean, I do agree with a lot of what they say. Um, but first of all, I want to challenge Gunther. Do you really believe in full water pricing? Do you really think that people, the solution to the water's problems, maybe you don't, but many uh, environmentalists believe that the solution to energy problems is to price it more expensively. Uh, is this what we should do in the developing world with water? And uh, secondly, um, is it legitimate to show a chart, it's always legitimate to show any chart, but is this chart legitimate that because Mayans in Central America in the 7th century died out because of water shortages, is, that, is the comparison between 7th century Mayan civilization and our civilization legitimate? When people talk about climate change sending temperatures up, you know, since they haven't been here since the Ice Age or after the Ice Age, there were only mammoths in the Ice Age. There weren't human beings. No high-speed trains, even for man mammoths. So I'm not sure that drawing conclusions from that earlier period is necessary. I wasn't saying you were doing that, but I, I know that people do use historical examples. And to Livia and Joanna, I mean, I want to know a lot more about solar irrigation. And of course, I believe in trust, open science, sharing data, education, but I put it to you that uh, a slump could mean Trump. Uh, and then we're not talking about trust, sharing data, uh, education or any of these things. So we have to be realistic. I think it's quite unrealistic, as I'm afraid to say, Joanna, to say that the purpose of better water supply is to produce more jobs. I think the purpose of better water supply, like better energy supply, is to produce more water and energy. And in fact, I'm imagining that there will be fewer jobs the more automated that we are. Now we have 200 million unemployed around the world and they need new jobs. But whether water and energy automation is the way to bring those new jobs, I'm far from certain. Okay, uh, I'm sorry to stop you there, James, but, but I'm very keen to, to get out to the floor and give you an opportunity to, to respond to some of these points that have been made. So, so you'll have to, have to wait to, re to respond to James, if, if, but perhaps the audience would like to. Um, so if, if anybody would like to either comment or ask a question, so we're not just doing the questions now, I'm going to take a few um, points from, from the floor at, at a time, and provided we, we have plenty, we usually do. Um, we're going to have two roving mics going around the room. So if you'd like to raise your hand, and I really will attempt to, to take anybody who, who want, wants to speak. So we'll start here, Mark, if you could get this. And, and it, can, can we see hands? Because I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try and plan, plan what we're going to do for the first few questions. So if there's anyone else at present. O over there, John. Yeah. Great. OK, thank you. Hello. I'm, I'm Giovanni Daneri. I come from uh, the Chilean Patagonia, the city of Coyhaique. We have uh, one of the biggest reserves of fresh water there. But in Chile, we have the system of pricing the water. And in practice, that means that some towns cannot grow anymore because the people has got the, the resources, the money, they buy the water rights and they impose other people what they had to do with it. I personally totally oppose such system. I know there is something to do with the tragedy of the commons behind when a resource can be used freely, but that had to be managed by the government, by the state, and not by the private sector. It's not the way to go. The other thing is that we, I think we are taking here a very anthropogenic view of things. Water is not only near for human beings. 
We need water to keep the ecosystem going. We tend to dissociate human well-being from ecosystem well-being, and they both go together. Okay, thank you. Was there another hand here somewhere? Yeah, can you get that mic? Okay, who's, who's got the mic? Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think the first three speakers have concentrated on uh, food and water, which is, of course, the most um, essential. And um, then James has touched on uh, saying we need more technical um, innovation. I don't think I agree on the more need for more automation, um, especially given the need for jobs and stuff. But that also um, made me think of... Um, like us in the Western world getting used to iPhones and cars and everything. Um, I mean, which is based on resources as well. Um, is it not a bit, is there, are there enough resources for everyone with an iPhone on earth? Or should we not um, stop the trend in that direction? I don't know, any thoughts on that maybe? Okay, thank you. Uh, any more hands? Just before I, t uh, yeah, just a moment. Uh, is, it, is there anyone want to want to speak at, at the moment? No hands at the moment? Yes, over here. Can you get that mic over there? Okay. <laughs> All right, sorry, go on. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm Jean Louberto from Paris, France. Uh, first, a uh, small uh, clarification. It seems that uh, agriculture, productivity, you mentioned this, but there are two aspects to that. One is the number of people which are needed to produce, to produce some, some food on some area. You address this question. Automation will in decrease the number of people who are needed to produce something. But there is the other aspect, which is what is the amount of, uh, of products that you can uh, raise from one particular area. And this is not increasing since the last 20 years. For instance, for crops, it, it is not increasing. So by confusing the two aspects, you are making a lot of, of, of confusion, I would say. The second point I'd like to make is that it seems that you have completely ignored the concept of ecological footprint. Now, the, uh, as we know, the ecological footprint is such that we spend 1.3 Earth uh, uh, instead of uh, having equilibrium at one. So it seems that you are ignoring everything there. The third point is that, in fact, <clears throat> you seem to be uh, trying to keep away of birth control over the planet, and you seem to try to organize to, uh, a, a world in which you will be able to feed 12 billion people. So I would like to end, and in this, in this case, perhaps you will have to force people who are eating beef, you are, will have to force them to eat wet. And I, I, there you begin to infringe freedom. Now I will end up by a question. Can you give me a single unique reason for which it's better for humanity to be more numerous than less numerous? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> just, just, just one moment, because um, uh, I will take you next. I'm just looking for hands. There was a hand over, over there, yeah. Okay, is there anyone else at, at the moment? So I can just keep an eye on, okay? All right, sorry, go on. There's another hand there. Hello, okay. uh, my name is Matteo Riva. I'm from the University of Bern. Uh, I obviously agree very much about the um, idea that we need better management and that best management, uh, better management can overturn these incredible uh, challenges that we have. Um, we, in many occasions, I've witnessed uh, debates about how science should be uh, should care more about the uh, implementation, how uh, we should have a more direct uh, relation with land users and land managers. Uh, but we also know that uh, as scientists we are pushed to be at the edge of research, to do a project, finish it, start something else. So I'm wondering if you think that there is a need for an intermediate figure that is what is more, uh, less and less present, especially in Europe, uh, an intermediate figure that stays on the land, that has a continuous relationship with the, the people, with the people that actually manage these resources, and uh, how can that be done on a global scale? Thank you. Thank you. And um, there was some, a hand just in front of you somewhere, wasn't there? Yeah, if you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but hold on, just, we'll take this one back here first, and then you. Hello, Manuel Kweiser from the University of Manchester. 
Um, I think you need um, a combined approach to tackle these questions. Um, you need optimization, innovation, uh, but at some point I think you will hit the limit because the Earth is some, it's kind of um, a closed system. I mean, there's only so and so much water, and what do you do when, you know, when, when, you, when you hit the limit? Because um, the population growth at the moment is, doesn't seem to be limited. So you need both, you need innovation and uh, education, um, and birth control, I think. And then education and birth control goes hand in hand. <laughs> I think that's my opinion. I think you need a, a two-sided approach. Okay, thank you. And yeah. Yeah, I'm Vina Schlichting from the Norwegian uh, Water Resource and Energy Department. I only have a short question. We were talking a lot about hydrology, enough water. What about soil? Because if we have more and more uh, automated agriculture, more and more demanipulation goes in hand with more pesticide use, and somehow the soils are getting more and more depleted, what do you think about how long soil kind of is capable for our amount of people on the earth? That would be interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I think I'll come back to the panel. We'll do just one, one round of responses. Please, please don't feel you have to respond to every question. The idea is that the whole panel can, can respond to what's come so far, and then we'll go back out to the floor. So, Gunter, if, you, if you'd care to comment on, on one or more of the, the questions and points that have been made. Okay. James has addressed me directly. And I appreciate that, because we're here not to agree, but to disagree, really. That's a debate. So I really like that. And I can say that I really disagree with what you are saying. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> You're finally looking at the supply side. I think if you only look at the supply side, that was my understanding, and not at the demand side, which is missing out on very important things. This is what humankind has been doing for a very long time, just increase supply and don't think about, don't manage demand. I think we'll be, we're missing out some very important opportunities we only, we, if we only look at supply. And related to the Maya question, so you were asking, is it a good idea to learn from history? I think it's a good idea to learn from history. So that was my, my interpretation anyway. I think it's a good idea to learn from the history, including the Mayas in, this, in the seventh century. Uh, there was another thing I would like to address here. Soil resources are, is the soil use sustainable? I think it's not only the soil that's an important part of it, but also the land. Uh, every year, like a huge area is lost to urbanization around the globe. And this is also soil loss, not only soil loss in terms of the quality of the soil, but in terms of the space that is lost for agricultural production. And then a final comment I would like to make regarding global water governance or global water management. We're talking about global water resources, how much water do we have globally, how much food do we have globally. But currently there is no global water governance. There's not one body around the world that is deciding about the water resources. And maybe we should not have it, because if we do have one body, there is a, there's, there's the risk that one unit actually determines about the livelihood of, of lots of people. I would be worried about uh, su such an institution. So maybe it's a good thing that it's a distributed governance uh, that there is more along the lines of cooperation rather than one institution, one ministry that distributes the water worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia. Thank you. Oh, I'll try with that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there are so many things that, uh, I'm sorry, I'll just respond to those that kept in my mind. So first I would like to second the demand side uh, uh, argument and uh, well, only because I, I've witnessed, witnessed myself the failure of many supply side uh, intervention for example in developing countries where you can see a drip irrigation kit abandoned uh, in the fields after a few years because there's lack of capacity, there's lack of, uh, of there are no spare parts there is no market to, to, to absorb this, uh, this production. So, uh, I mean, you need, you need both, of course, and you really need, and the one important thing is that demand is not always the same. I mean, you really need to understand the local context uh, and before deciding what kind of supply side intervention you, you would uh, need to make. Uh, another point I really appreciated is the, is the, the point about the linkage between research and implementation, which I think is, uh, is very important. 
uh, probably we need uh, an intermediate uh, um, figure that I mean uh, step that that is possible. I, I think that it's also very important that we understand the, uh, each other. I mean, apart from having an intermediate uh, uh, person, uh, for example, I can uh, I can uh, touch upon the uh, the application of remote sensing uh, for agriculture, and in that case. Uh, for example, in Africa, they think, of it, think that the, the average, average land holding size is less than half an hectare, and that is less than a modi species, less than uh, thermal, any thermal infrared uh, application, uh, which is so important for monitoring evapotranspiration, for example. So we really need to understand the, the, the limitation and the opportunities before trying to get to an intermediate uh, step, and I think because science is advancing at such a speed and technology even more i mean we there's we we really need to to speak i mean to to talk each other more on that thank you thank you um, you man. thank you I would like first to address uh, your question about uh, water and jobs actually the report is not about creating more jobs but uh, on how to uh, look and perform at our jobs nowadays, especially because there is a lot of data coming from monitoring and how can this be used to better management, that's exactly what the report is, to better manage, to optimize the use of resources in water. So that uh, is uh, what is good in that uh, part. Uh, while coming um, back to some of the question i think that uh, if uh, the welfare of population uh, is uh, going up then uh, history shows that the uh, the rate of birth is going down uh, so there is a there maybe that's an answer to uh, birth control i don't think so that we should have that in place it's just that uh, the society through welfare will uh, bring this uh, down and also um, coming to i'm picking uh, jumping and picking about the iphone if i understand well there was a request why shouldn't we ban the smartphones and the iphones well, it's very easy to say from this perspective and from uh, having access to iPhones that we should ban it for the others. Uh, I think we should not ban it, especially we should use this technology to provide more information to uh, those who are doing agriculture. So through the use of uh, smartphones, uh, there are a lot uh, of it, there is a lot of information that can be provided. Even they can be advised through phones in Africa what to plant, what will go on, based on uh, forecasting. So uh, it's not for us to say that good uh, technology should not be used. I think that that's uh, well. I I think that uh, that was it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I don't want to have a fight with Gunter because I know that he will win. Uh, but uh, my point was not not to learn from history. Obviously, we've got to learn from history. My point is, is the metaphor of Easter Island or the Mayans or the Ice Age relevant to human civilization today? Is the comparison legitimate? Are we not more powerful? You might say that we have more hubris, but there's no doubt that we are more powerful. And I think that answers my, my friendly French friend, if, I, if you are French or maybe Belgian in the red. Um, what's the possible benefit of 12 billion people, not 7 billion people? I would say 5 billion more brains. And for me, that's very important if you want to raise agricultural productivity. Of course, we do face, well, you can shake your head, but I like 5 billion brains. Um, the, we may be facing declining yields, but uh, I'm sure that there are new ways around that. And I think what Gunter has said about land is very important. Land is being lost to urbanization, but there's an enormous amount of land around the world still available for agriculture. There's an enormous amount of sea available for aquaculture. And uh, when I hear um, from our French friend, I love the French, but I can't agree with the idea 
of ecological footprints. Are you sure you don't mean boot prints? And I'd love to know about the, I mean, it's a metaphor, it's an analogy. We have a pristine earth, we put a boot on it, we mess it up, and we are now using our 1.3 earths. Are you sure it's not 1.4 earths? Or maybe 1.2? I wonder how you measure the earth like that. That doesn't seem to me uh, very convincing. Where I do agree with you is that telling people to ha eat wheat, not beef, or birth control, which seems so popular, um, is infringing their freedom. And I think we've infringed enough on the freedom of the world, especially the developing world. I can completely agree that there are no spare parts for automation in the third world. But then I think that's a human problem, a political problem, not an argument against supply-side measures. There are many problems in uh, developing countries, and we in the West are responsible for quite a lot of them, including pesticides depleting the soil. I look forward to better pesticides, ones that will not do that. And I think if we have confidence in ourselves as human beings, we can do a little bit better than the mammoths and the Myers, and we can indeed, what the speaker suggested, feed and water the world. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to come back out to you now again. Um, I hope that that stimulated uh, some more thoughts and some more comments and questions. So uh, if I can see uh, hands, and I will, I will try and make sure that I get to anyone who'd like to speak. I see there's one here, John, yeah, and there's one, yeah. Okay, great, there's a few. So yeah, if you do that one at the back, Mark, and then, then John, if you, can, if you can then take that one round to there afterwards. Um, okay. Hello, uh, this is Jan Steinhang. I've got a is. question which I didn't hear about uh, during the whole discussion. Um, five million more brains will do nothing without education. And I think the, one of the most important things which are not quite covered that good here is that you really need to educate the people because otherwise um, people who are rich will be richer and uh, will still stay very egoistic and yeah and that's basically it I think you've, you're forgetting about that if, uh, if you have brilliant people they will uh, help themselves. And that's the, the point I wanted to make here. Okay, thank you. And the person with the mic here, and, and Mark, if you could bring that forward. Yeah, to the, yeah that'd be great. Hello? Uh, no, it's not oh, it's working, yes. okay. Um, I have a question on a point which has not been really raised yet, and that is about like, um, what will happen if we continue eating this uh, genetically modified uh, organism, because in the end we will, I think, also suffer from more diseases like cancer, and uh, it's really shown um, in like, non-biased sciences that it's really bad for us um, in the uh, developed world. And, um, in the end, I think we cannot sustain our population on the world with the amount of people. It's just unrealistic. We will die either from starvation or we die from the diseases, which are caused by eating this GMO food. Okay, thank you. Um, the, yeah, the, I know there's a mic, mic there, but John, if you could take that mic, there's someone else with a hand somewhere back there. There, there it is, yeah, so if we, Okay, the person with the mic now, yeah. Hi, I'm um, from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, so the comments about Trump are pretty apt. Um, and the comments about politics and supply side uh, water systems are interesting. Um, I know in the United States there was an effort to get uh, Great Lake water pumped from the Great Lakes down into the arid southwest, um, which was stopped. And there was the comment by uh, Professor Bloch about um, the distributed governance of water systems, um, which made me think about uh, the potential for water wars and whether or not the panel thinks uh, if conflicts will arise directly from water shortages and the uh, unequal distribution of water, or if that's um, more a secondary or tertiary problem. Okay, thank you. Um, any, any more hands that we can get this, this mic to while the next person's speaking? 
Not at the moment. Yes, there's one down here, Mark. Okay, but um, great. But the, the person with the mic now. So, well, I'm not really happy with this ominous number of 12 billion people that can allegedly be fed by us. So right now we're 7 billion and we just survive because we don't live sustainably. So we don't consume water sustainably, we don't consume from the oceans sustainably, from the forests and so on. And if you say that it's not easy to calculate an ecological footprint of 1.4 or 1.3, well, so you come up with a number of 12 billion people that can be fed, I think this is also not so easy to be calculated. And I think we Europeans have to change ourselves just in terms of consumption, we have still have an ecological footprint of three planets. If everybody would live like we do in the US, they have it from six planets. Or also people in like Saudi Arabia have to change because you can't maintain a, a fertility rate of five children per woman if you don't have any water to feed the children or any sustainable water. So in my opinion, we have to change and I think that 12 billion is not really realistic. Okay, thank you. And this uh, hold on just one second. Are there any hands? Yes, there's a hand here. So if we could get this mic down to here, John. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, Cédric Lanel. Um, I would like to know what you think about this new buzzword that we hear a lot, uh, the circular economy that could, in a way, uh, resolve this issue of uh, having resource for all. Okay, thank you. Um, by, by the way, because this probably is going to be the last round of questions, if anyone wants to respond to things that are coming from the floor as well, please feel free to do so. This is supposed to be a conversation between all of us. Um, there, there's another hand there, yeah, Mark. And Yeah, brilliant. If they, just at the back first. And then, John, if you get to this, this person with the grey arm. <laughs> I can just see an arm there uh, afterwards. And then we've got someone over here. Okay, uh, yeah. I would like to ask uh, Professor Wouthuysen where to get sustainably the energy from to feed all those machines that are supposed to take over automatically the farming. Okay, thank you. And yeah, and if you could get that mic here yeah, back there. Yeah. Yeah. So I I would just like to comment on the idea of reducing demand, and I, I just query why uh, it seems such a bad thing to. Uh, for people to use resources more efficiently, perhaps in in this part of the world as well, as, so that there are more to go around with everyone else as well. I'm all for using new technology uh, in uh, the most optimal ways possible, but surely that would mean, say, to take again the the example of these uh, mobile telephones that, um, and the question that we had of whether everyone in the world should have them. Well, surely it would be better for every community in the world to have access to them, but maybe we should have fewer in this part of the world and more in other parts of the world, because actually it might be, we might find that it's more beneficial to do that for other reasons as well. For example, people seem to get, uh, you know, addicted to these devices these days, and maybe their quality of life would increase if not everyone had one. And likewise, you could say with meat, that if people eating meat, uh, you know, several times a day is actually worse for their health, so their quality of life would increase if they ate, if we ate less in this part of the world, and then people could eat more in other parts of the world, and surely that would be a better way than simply to try to use technology to uh, create a situation whereby everyone could eat meat all the time and have smartphones all the time. We would all benefit if we, if we actually were more moderate and got the right the right balance in, in all of our lives. So that was just a, a thought. Okay, thank you. And there was a hand down here, Mark, if you want to come down. Can you put your hand back up so that he can see where you are? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Is it on? Okay. Good. Um, hi, I'm Bas from the University of Aberdeen. And um, I have a question for uh, Professor uh, Blushel, because he mentioned the availability of water for, for humans. But um, no one's really addressed the availability of water for ecosystems and how they function. Because we can take up all the water, but if that leaves nothing for ecosystems, then we'll have issues to maintain a way of living in the future as well. Thanks. OK, thank you. Yeah. Yes. First and foremost, I would like to thank you all the speaker, because everything is very interesting. My name is Enrico, and I have a question to all of you about, uh, actually in concrete, uh, what the European Union is doing uh, 
according to the different policy, the different governments uh, for boosting agriculture, for uh, improving the agriculture. And uh, I would like to leave uh, to all of you a provocation, like uh, the title is very nice, Planet Earth is there enough resource for all. But what I would like to really understand is, in your calculation, in the chart you have shown to us, is uh, you meant like enough resources for all, like people living like us, so in this case you should uh, continue for all the developed countries or for all the people living in this planet? Thanks. Thank you. Um, right, there's one hand there and there's one hand here. So, uh, Mark, if you could get that one over to here. Uh, if there are any, any more comments, because this, this really is this is going to be just a couple more. There's going to be one at the back afterwards, John, over there, and I think that's, that's going to be it, okay? Right, uh, the person at the back with the mic. Love. Sorry, we can't hear. Can we have that mic on the... That's not... Uh... No, I think that's working now, I think. I think, is it? Okay, thank you. Um, and the, yeah. So my name is Ezek Kopec, I'm from Poland, University of Warsaw. So my question is uh, regarding uh, maybe, let's assume for a moment that we have all those resources, we can feed humanity, we can provide supply for 12 billion people, whatever. But my question is how we do it. You all said improved management, and right now what we have is two approaches, more or less, to management a top-to-down approach, uh, so centralized management, or extreme opposites, so uh, down to top. So we just throw, for example, an innovation like a smartphone on a, or whatever at the market and see if emergence uh, order is efficient. So both of them in our history provided to be inefficient and uh, are creating bottlenecks in the supply chains which will ultimately lead to shortage of resources somewhere. Even we, if we have lots of them, there will be a shortage somewhere, there will be overwhelming uh, supply in other region. So we can do something, something in between, we can regionalize, but this will also lead to imbalance of this. So how do we do it? What is the new paradigm of management of global resource? So that's okay. my question. Thank you. And I lost where the... Oh, there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Is that... Perhaps we could swap mics. Thanks, Mark, if we could... No, it works. Okay, sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, my name is Larry Lopez. I'm from Yamagata University in Japan. Uh, my question was uh, if we have 12 billion people in the world and you think that we can feed all of them, what is the standard you are thinking about? Are they going to eat like Europeans, Ethiopians, or Japanese? I don't know how you can feed 12 billion people. And it's not a matter only of technology. I think it's more a matter, of, or even management, it's more a, a matter of education, which has been mentioned already several times. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, OK, I'm going to come back to the, the panel. Um, there's no way you'll be able to respond to everything because I'm, um, you know, I, I do, do realise. But, but the idea, okay, here is, is to open up the conversation, and I do hope that you'll come out of this room and continue the conversation, um, it's because I'm only going to give the panel a minute each to to, to come back. So, so uh, I realise you're not going to answer everything. But uh, if you want to be <laughs> selective, then uh, Gunter, if you'd like to take a minute. Thank you. The question was, is better management possible? And it's a real good question because you can also only answer that properly 
if you actually implement that? Because technologically it's possible, but is it politically possible? Well, that's a very interesting question. Second question was ecosystems, uh, water for the environment, water for humans. Yeah, of course, qu qu quite a few water, ma water companies, they say, my biggest client is the environment. And there's, of course, the trade-off between direct water use, but at the end, water for the environment is also through the lens of what people consider important. So ultimately, it's also human usage, because it's a human goal if they want to give water to the environment. My final comment is about risk. Maybe we should be taking more risks. It's ultimately, it's about decision-making in an uncertain future. So it's, uh, it boils down to risks. Maybe we should also do more high-risk research ourselves, like high-gain, high-potential research that uh, reaches out to different fields in order to better understand uh, possible trajectories of future resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I will go back to this figure of these 12 billion people, which has been so recurring. <laughs> that, uh, I mean, I feel a bit sorry for that because I, I brought it to this debate because I thought that <laughs> what would be, I mean, kept in, in, the, in your mind wouldn't be the 12 billion, but rather than one of eight which still live with chronic hunger. And I think that is the problem we need to address today and in the near future, I mean, because the 12 billion, who knows when they will be there. And, and to address this one, in AIDS, still with, with, with chronic hunger, we need agriculture because, I mean, we, we, we know that the, the economic growth that the, uh, originating in the agricultural sector in rural areas is way more effective in reducing extreme poverty. And it is also why uh, hunger, malnutrition and sustainable agriculture are uh, included in the first uh, two sustainable development goals approved recently at the UN. I know this is probably too UN again for you, but without a political commitment from member countries, there's no way that this science and innovation can bring anywhere. So that's, we need both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's very interesting to see that the question that comes most often is uh, if uh, the 12 billion will eat like Europeans, the examples were here, Europeans, Japanese, that's a very, uh, in a way, unfair. I think everyone should eat uh, at their own, uh, according to their own culture. So what we as scientists should uh, go for is really to eradicate malnutrition and to have everyone as well-being. It doesn't matter if it eats like an European or like uh, somebody uh, from Asia, it, as long as they eat according to how they have been uh, raised, uh, that it is uh, well for their health. Uh, and uh, while it's not a question that has been put to me, but uh, I'm trying to say that uh, technology will offer us in the future new ways of energy. If we look uh, how uh, solar energy uh, is used nowadays and it was not available uh, uh, 10 years back, uh, if we look how um, now uh, oil from the ground is replaced by uh, 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 oil coming from uh, agriculture, uh, that means that we will not be in short of energy supply for uh, machines. So I think I took your question, but... Uh. Thank you. Yeah, and that's, bef that's before we've uh, done better than the fusion project, ITER. You know the budget for ITER? It's $10 billion. It'll buy roughly buy you a home in central London nowadays. <laughs> so we're not doing anything about fusion. We're closing down fission. But there is plenty of energy from the sun. If we improve the f efficiency of photovoltaic panels, which is very weak, then we can do a lot in that to, to get the energy for automation. What's the EU? What, what's happening on the circular economy? Well, the EU has committed 6 billion euros to the circular economy. That's the same EU that instituted the Common Agricultural Policy, which has worked to the advantage of Africa for the last 50 years. As we know, the EU has always helped Africa with the CAP. 
well, you're not laughing, but you ought to be laughing. Uh, and that's where I agree with Gunter. I mean, everybody called for better management. I think what Gunter was hinting at is we need a better politics. I mean, management isn't just a grey, boring thing, but, you know, what are our priorities? And we need better politics than the, uh, the EU. Now, when we're talking about politics, uh, I want to ask our iPhone friend at the back, if you want to go around the room collecting everybody's iPhones and distributing condoms, go right ahead. But what, uh, what the demand side people have to suggest is which agency, if it isn't the EU and it isn't the Pope and it isn't Bruno Kreisky, who is going to do all of this stuff to make sure that we only eat um, brown rice in the West uh, and never eat beef again? It seems to me that the hatred for 12 billion people, and the hatred for 5 billion extra, the hatred for our lifestyles in the West, misses the point that we have the ability, if we think carefully, if we have a new politics, to feed those people any way that they like. They can eat beef, they can eat raw fish, they can even eat iPhones if they're really, uh, if they're really interested. So. You know, I'm, uh, the lady there said that, we, you know, we've got a choice. We, we, we die of disease or we die of climate change. Um, actually, more people have had better jobs in the world in the last 20 years, chiefly because of the very bad policies of the Chinese Communist Party. But more people are more optimistic than the lady who thinks we're all going to die tomorrow. So let's have some faith in human engineering and in what we can do. Okay, I'd like uh, to thank our panel very much. I would also just like to thank my co-conveners. Um, there's uh, Jonathan Dick and Mark Wilkinson who have been wandering, running around with microphones. Paul Quinn who's been uh, bouncing at the door there is uh, <laughs> not letting people out I think uh, and, and Chris, Chris Julian who's, who's just been smiling very nicely from, from the from the front throughout so thanks to them and thanks to you uh, thanks for your questions and your points has been much appreciated <laughs>